Hey guys, this is Brody. I'm in my kitchen in Salt Lake City. I haven't gone more than 50 feet from this spot in a long time. Um, we have been in self-isolation for a while today, and I realized that while we probably shouldn't be skiing right now, we want to be thinking about skiing. And I think one way to do that is um, to take this time as an opportunity to like review and revise our systems that we use while we are backcountry skiing because sometimes it's not good to be thinking about it while we're out there and try to tweak with things and think about other things because we want our minds to be on avalanche hazard and other heuristic traps. Um, and now, however, we can sit at home and think about what can I do to like tweak my systems a little bit to make my backcountry experiences a little bit better. So we're gonna give people a couple of minutes to join. Uh, we're also gonna be broadcasting this on YouTube at a later date. But if you're here right now, stick around. I've got the kitchen table full of gear, some of which I take on everyday ski, to ski tours, some of which I take on someday ski tours, and some of which I personally just don't take on ski tours. But I kind of want to go through what I think a lot of people uh, kind of ponder while deciding what to ski, because I think it's really easy to kind of get caught in this, this spot of, I don't really know what I should be taking. I see what some people take, I see what other people take, it's not always the same thing, and it's like there's not a set kit that you should be carrying while you're ski touring. So today, we're gonna go through what my kit is. It's pretty set for most days. Um, and then I want you to be able to take that, adapt it to yourselves. Um, if you give a small donation via Venmo at Brody11, I'm happy to send you like the full outline for this workshop. Um, it's pretty detailed. You'll be able to like take some notes on there as well as um, kind of review what we talked about and why some of these systems work for me and why they might work for you. Are people joining? Yeah. Okay, cool. So hi guys again, it's Brody, Kitchen, Salt Lake City. We're gonna start going through different ski touring kits uh, that I use. I've personally, I've been ski touring for like 13 years now. Um, what? You're really loud, it's echoing a lot. Oh, okay, sorry. Katie's helping me film over there. So if you guys have any questions, first of all, I want you to go ahead and type them in Instagram right now. Um, I'll just address them as I'm going. Katie's looking at the screen and she'll be able to ask them. Um, but in the meantime, we're gonna go through various pieces of the kit starting at backpacks. Like I said, I've been ski touring for like about 13 years. 100% um, of my skiing has been in the backcountry for about 10 years. Uh, yeah, that's about right. Um, and I've, I've really kind of honed in on this kit. I'm a very like specific and detail oriented person. If you were at the how to dress for backcountry skiing little online workshop that I did a week ago, you'll see that I've kind of thought through every little detail when it comes to what I wear. Well, that translates to what I carry in the backcountry as well. I don't want to carry extra weight when I'm in the backcountry because extra weight, they say like a pound on your foot is like 10 pounds in your backpack and 10 pounds in your backpack does not feel good when you're hiking up. So I want to maximize the amount of skiing I can do while I'm out there, but I also want to do it comfortably. I want to be able to do it day in and day out without being miserable. And lastly, I don't want ski touring to be like burdensome in my mind. I don't want to think of it as something that's just like, oh gosh, I got to go ski touring tomorrow, but I got to think through like, what I put in my backpack and like I haven't gone ski touring for a month so like I don't want to forget anything. Instead I want it streamlined, I want it easy and one thing you can do um, that I recommend because it can help you not forget things is to have a checklist when you go backcountry skiing. Especially if you're not doing it every day but even those of us that do it, do it every day still forget ski boots or forget gloves or whatever. So I like to have like a laminated checklist that you can just use a sharpie on or whatever and just check things off as you go. Either that or keep all of your stuff that you take ski touring in one area. Hi, Spaghetti's here with us today. Hi, girl. Um, and so I think uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is backpacks. Um, and we're going to talk about things now because I don't think it's right to think about them and focus on them when you're ski touring. The last thing you want to do while you're touring is think about things like, oh gosh, I wish I brought a different backpack or like I'm wearing the wrong layers or like, do I even have my avalanche shovel in my backpack? We don't want to think about those things while we're ski touring. We want our equipment to be in the back of our minds. Our front of our minds should be consisting of like avalanche hazards. They should be consisting of communication errors. They, can, they should be consisting of navigation, right? They shouldn't be consisting of like, oh no of like, oh, am I carrying the right stuff with me today? Like how many pairs of gloves should I have? And like, 
is my probe long enough for this, uh, for this snowpack? So we don't want to think about those things while we're doing it. Instead, while we're all cooped up at home right now, now is the perfect time to review and revise our kits to maximize our efficiency and definitely enhance our enjoyment of backcountry skiing. Okay? Cool. So, thanks, Spaghetti. She'll probably come in and out. Uh, yes, Kitty. We have a question here. Uh, I feel like it may be appropriate time soon. What do you put at the bottom of your bag versus closer to the top? Yeah, it's a good question. So we're kind of talking about the order in which we pack. And so I'm going to actually go through the individual pieces of kit in the order that I pack them. I don't think you're going to be very surprised to learn that I put the things that I least expect to use and the least necessary things to be able to access quickly on the bottom of my pack. The top of my pack is going to consist of the things that I'm accessing regularly. Hopefully I'm not digging into my pack too much. So, I like to think of backpacks as coming in four different sizes. There's like rando, like randonnée racing backpacks that are really small. They're between five and 20 liters. Um, they fit more like vests. The, the waist belts can be really big. They can have lots of pockets on the front, um, so you don't have to take your backpack off. And they have a really cool ski carry system that allows you to put your skis on your back to boot pack with without removing your backpack. Um, I personally don't have one of those here. Um, they're great. I definitely encourage those. However, they typically max out around 20 liters, and most people end up using more than 20 liters as their everyday ski pack, especially those of us that are less experienced. The more experience you get, the most likely the less stuff you're gonna carry. Um, so we'll go from top down from rando racing. Uh, there are large ski packs, right? I'm going to categorize these as typically being used for overnight missions. You see people using them actually as everyday backpacks because not everyone can afford multiple backpacks. And if you want to not limit what you're doing, you're probably going to buy the biggest one so you can do the big stuff with it and then just have it underpacked for your small stuff. The big packs are not something that I ski with regularly um, on on certain expeditions, I'll use a pack this big, but really infrequently. Um, a couple years ago, I was in the country of Georgia skiing, and we had to we had horses go up to a certain spot where the snow line started, and from there we had to ferry our own gear. Um, we took a couple of trips, uh, a few miles, a few thousand feet, and I had a big like 75 liter backpack for that. I'm gonna say big pack packs are like. 55 liters plus. They go all the way to 100 liters, right? This is like a 75, I think. Um, I'm gonna get it out there real quickly, guys. I'm not gonna be talking about name brands or anything like that for the most part during this workshop because I want you to realize that you don't need the most expensive stuff, you don't need the name brand stuff, and for me personally, the name brands don't matter. I'm using stuff that is available to me, I use stuff that's a good value, and I'm not focusing on the different brands of gear. So if you have questions about the brands of stuff I have, just Google like 75 liter backpack, because you know what, there's about a million of them, and I encourage you to like kind of use your own discretion as which one is best for you. Um, this is a 75 liter pack, I pretty much never ski with it. However, in order to be able to ski with it, it has to have side straps in case I need to boot pack with it, and so all of my backpacks are gonna have side straps. On a backpack this big, they're not usually intended for skis, they're intended for compression, so when you load your stuff up, you can cinch it tight, um, but they also work for skis. However, these ski straps that are made for compression also tend to get torn up by ski edges. So something, something that you want to keep in mind. And lastly, you want to keep in mind how they connect. Are they um, strong enough to really cinch on when you put your skis in there? In addition to a heavy backpack, sometimes you'll have your ski boots on your skis on your back and you want to be able to tighten those up without the buckles breaking. If the buckles break, what are you going to do? That's something to think, keep in mind of when you're looking at different backpacks. So, large backpack, 55 liters plus. Let's look at medium backpacks now, and we're going to say those are, let's say, 40 to 55 liters. Um, this, I think, is a 45 liter backpack. Uh, it has a couple different ski carry systems, including the compression things on the side. It also has a diagonal ski carry system. I'm going to go into various ski carry systems in a second. Um, this backpack, I'll use this size backpack in that 40 to 55 range. For me, it'll be 40 or 45. I'll use this when I'm carrying, I'll do a really quick overnight trip with this because I can totally fit a sleeping bag and a small tent in here, or I will do it with like a bigger ski mountaineering kit. That's not typically the case. I can usually fit all my ski mountaineering gear for like a day mission into a smaller 30 liter backpack. Um, if for some reason you're bringing like 60 meter ropes or something like that that are more like climbing ropes, 
Maybe you don't have a ski specific five millimeter cord. Maybe you're using like your climbing rope because you need to rappel in the middle of a couloir and you can't afford another $300 rope. I totally get that. Those things take up a lot of space. Um, so you might be looking at a bigger backpack or again, using your one backpack that you have and strapping it to the outside of it. Um, so yeah, medium sized backpack. I also rarely use that size. Sorry, spaghetti. Um, and now we're getting to the backpack that I've used every day this season, which I'll consider on the smaller end. I think this one is 30 liters. Um, it is uh, probably on the smaller side for a lot of... What are you making that face for? She was gonna... Nothing, keep going. Spaghetti's eating a cactus? Is that what she's doing? Yeah. Um, so this again, this is a 30 liter backpack. It's more than enough space for me on an everyday basis. And I'm gonna go through what I put in here so you can see how few things are actually in here and why I can use such a small backpack. If I had a 20 liter backpack, I would use that most days. Um, you'll notice that all of my backpacks are top load, meaning like they're rucksack style. They just have one big opening from the top. There's no zipper, It's they're all um, cinched to close. What? Um, they're all cinched to close, they just have like a cinch here, and that's it. One-handed opening when it's on the ground or on someone's back. Um, that is because zippers, so if you picture backpacks coming in different couple, a couple different styles, you can picture like your school backpacks growing up that had like a clamshell opening with a big zipper. Then you can picture a couple other zipper styles maybe, like they open on your back panel. All of those things are just extra stuff, it's extra weight, but primarily zippers break. The number of times that I've been out in the backcountry um, with someone who has a backpack with a zipper and the zipper has broken is greater than one. Maybe it's greater than two actually. Zippers break and that is not reliable. And the last thing you want in the backcountry, again, is to worry about your gear. You want to be concerned with your own safety. And to a certain extent, gear failure does affect your own safety. So all of my backpacks are top load. Does that mean it's easy to access stuff in the bottom? Well, actually for me, yes, because I know exactly how my backpack is packed. I pack it the same every time, and I know I can just reach down and feel that one item because I don't have a million things in here. Is it nice to have a big back panel that opens? For sure. Have I used those backpacks? For sure. Am I prepared to fix them if they break? Definitely, and that requires a knife and a ski strap usually. Um, but all my backpacks top load, and I'm pretty set on that. Um, all of the backpacks that I use are also like waterproof-ish. They're like this Dyneema Cordura material-ish. Um, they are not watertight, right? They're not usually roll bags. Um, if you have something like Hyperlite Mountain Gear Pack, those are actually roll top and they can be waterproof. But usually this is plenty for me. This one cinches on top and then it has this little flap to cover that hole. That is plenty for a ski tour during the day, even with wet snow. Um, I've never had any problem with like significant moisture accumulating uh, through this little opening right here. Um, so I wanna always make sure I have that. You don't want like one of these backpacks that feel like they're pretty much cotton. That's not doing you any favors really. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm always stick to the top load backpacks. Um, one question that some of you may have is airbags. I'm not personally using an airbag right now. I do believe there are now kind of four pieces of avalanche equipment that are essential for most people. That is beacon, shovel, probe, and now airbag. They statistically, the science all points to it, the data points to it, I mean, airbags increase your likelihood of survival in an avalanche. If you don't see that as a good reason to use one, I don't know what could convince you. They're expensive, you can get them around 500 bucks now, but they're usually more like 1100, 1200, 1300 dollars. Um, but that's when you have to ask yourself, hey, you bought a $500 beacon, right? Like what is that price that you put on your life if it comes down to that? Um, one thing to keep in mind though with airbags is there's, not a, there's a ton of backpacks for sale, but there are not a ton of airbag backpacks for sale. If you're really specific about your backpack features, you may have to prioritize airbag or backpack features because they're not gonna have the exact features that you want in an airbag backpack. For example, you can't find a backpack with only top load rucksack style in an airbag backpack. They just don't make them because of the way that the airbag has to deploy. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind if you're ready to deal with the big zipper of the clamshell techniques. Question. Why aren't you using an airbag? 
I'm personally not using an airbag for a variety of reasons, mainly because I'm so specific with the backpacks that I use and I know the features that I need. Um, in certain terrain, I for sure use backpacks. If avalanches are my main, or excuse me, airbags. If avalanches are my main concern, I'm using airbags. If other things like rockfall or carrying the right equipment are my main concern, because sometimes ease of access to gear or speed, because airbags are, um, are heavier, which then makes you slower, these things may affect your safety as much as an avalanche. So it depends on the terrain that I'm skiing. Um, if you guys can afford two backpacks, yeah, get an airbag, get a non-airbag, get a small one, get a big one, whatever it takes. Um, and they make some pretty cool modular airbags now where you can like buy a backpack and zip an airbag onto it on the days that you want it. If you're looking at airbag backpacks, they come pretty much in two styles, compressed air, I think, like CO2 or nitrogen or something, and electric. Um, there are pros and cons to each. Uh, the electric is what I tend to lean toward because you can um, discharge it more than once in a day and there have been recorded accidents where someone has been caught in more than one avalanche a day and had to discharge their airbag more than once. Um, you can easily travel with them because all you need to do is plug them into a wall to charge them. Uh, the cold affects them a little bit more, but in general, easier to charge, easier to discharge, more frequent discharges, um, and yeah, I just find them... I personally lean toward that. Um, however, there are a lot of people still using compressed air airbags because they're also cheaper. Um, okay, cool, so I got my backpack. Any other notes on backpack? Oh, helmet stowage. I ski with the helmet every single day for the past 15 years now, probably. I got a couple concussions consecutively on a couple different years, and my mom just asked. She wasn't gonna ask me to stop skiing. She's like, will you please start wearing a helmet? Because I grew up skiing in Ohio. Nobody wore helmets. I don't know if they do now, but nobody wore them. So my mom's like, please start skiing with a helmet. I moved out here. Everyone was already skiing with a helmet. Um, I have a variety of helmets. This one's triple certified, so it has both climbing certifications, which protect you from impacts on the top, as well as ski certification, which protects you from impacts from trees on the sides. Um, this is super light. Um, there's nothing to really break on it. They are fragile, but um, one thing you see people with all sorts of different helmet stowage options on their backpacks. Uh, they'll have them inside. They will have them in like a helmet carry system, or they will have them dangling on the outside of their backpack. One reason I always ski with a backpack that's larger than like the contents that I need, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is because I just want to be able to toss my helmet inside. I don't want to like be fidgeting with these little clips on the outside of my backpack, taking my hands out of my gloves, introducing cold injuries, introducing moisture back into my gloves. I want to avoid that at all costs. Instead, I want to be able to keep my helmet inside so again, I can do more stuff with my gloves on and less fidgeting. Less fidgeting is also faster. Question? Um, which helmet is that and also looking for one that's dual rated? Yeah, so um, triple certified helmets, oh, oh, most helmet companies are now making them. If you look at a website um, that does ski mountaineering gear, almost all of them are triple certified. This helmet has like 10 different name brands that white label it, um, or one company that white labels it for like 10 different brands. Um, it's not, go to like Ski Moco or one of those websites and you'll see like tons of triple certified helmets. I don't even know what brand this one actually is, um, but they, this is like really common and they all weigh about the same-ish. Um, some of them look more like bike helmets, which, you know, may or may not be that cool to ski with. Um, skiing with a climbing helmet is definitely an option. It's not ski certified, so beware of that, which means impact from the front sides and back aren't as covered. Um, however, it depends what you're concerned with hitting you in the head. Uh, ski helmets are, excuse me, uh, climbing helmets are light. Bike helmets are light. I prefer to use something that's uh, intended for the way that I'm using it. Um, so yeah, there's a variety of them. Um, any other questions there, Katie? So helmet stowage, I don't personally look for that feature. I, if I do have it, I cut it off and I just put my helmet inside the backpack. Um, I said, if it reminds you of the backpack that your little cousin takes to like third grade, that's probably not the kind of backpack you want. All these pockets, all these features, like the fleece lined helmet pockets, you don't want that stuff. It's just extra stuff, extra stuff to break. And then you're the person being like, huh, where's my granola bar? Is it in this pocket? Is it in this pocket? Oh, there's is it like what pockets it and you're like going through everything right and like you just don't want to be that person it's really really nice you'll see a lot of inexperienced skiers skiing with these backpacks that have all these pockets on them and then most of the experienced skiers skiing with one big pocket actually two pockets one for avalanche safety gear one for everything else and then usually like a small pocket for like your car keys and stuff um remember zippers are weak if you need to repair them 
If you have a backpack that has a big zipper on your back panel, that thing can blow out so easily because most likely you have a lot of stuff in your backpack, you're like throwing it over your shoulder, that thing blows out. And like, what do you do? Seriously, you're like deep in the backcountry. What do you do with that? So you carry a knife, you cut, say it's, it's torn right here, you can't get it past here. Or, I mean, it's probably you can't get the whole thing. So you like cut a little bit on this fabric, cut a little bit on this fabric, and you string or a ski strap or some sort of P cord to go through this out here and to tie this. Do the same thing here, same thing here, same thing here, same thing here. Do it with as much stuff as you can find, and that's gonna like cinch your backpack closed and allow you to at least limp home. Again, if you want to carry an entire another backpack, like your your level of field re kit, field repair kit is going to vary depending on your comfort level. So carry as much as you want. Me, that's what I would carry if I'm using a backpack with zippers on it. Okay. First thing I always load up is my what I'm calling the direct avalanche e safety equipment. This is the stuff to use to dig out your friend if he or she is buried in an avalanche. Those are the things you're thinking, beacon shovel probe, right? I keep my beacon in my pants pocket. If you're curious why, you can sign up for my first workshop, How to Dress for Backcountry Skiing, by sending me a $6 donation to at Brody11 on Venmo. If, if you're not interested in where I keep my beacon, don't worry about it, but I don't keep it in my backpack. None of you should be keeping your beacon in your backpack because if you're caught in an avalanche, your backpack can be ripped off your body. It can be deposited 100 yards from your body and your friends are all looking at their beacons and they go dig up your backpack and you're nowhere to be found. Your beacon should always be kept on your person, either on the, uh, the harness, that is the chest harness that it comes with, or in your pocket. So, first things I pack up is my pro. Um, I have three pros here today. Because again, you don't need to have all these options of each of these, but I want to talk you through the options that are available because that will make it easier for you to decide, hey, I'm going to buy one probe, which should it be? The answer to that is if you're going to buy one probe, which should it be? It should be the longest probe you can get. Because the longer the, <laughs> because the, longer the probe, um, the deeper, if, if you're in a really deep snowpack, you're going to need a long probe to potentially find your buddy. It is not unheard of for be people to be buried six, eight, 10, 12, 15 feet deep. So trust me, you're gonna want the longest probe you can get. They don't make 15 foot probes. I'm gonna go from shortest to longest. I've got a 240 centimeter probe here. This one's made of carbon. Carbon is really lightweight and really strong until it breaks and it shatters and it's completely unusable. This is a personal preference whether or not you're willing to use carbon probes. Carbon probes are great for places where there is really soft snow. In the spring, maybe when you're skiing over a lot of ice, but there's still avalanche danger, I wouldn't suggest using a carbon probe because the last thing you want is to be like going to probe someone out and you're like doing this, you're trying to find it and you hit an ice, an ice block and your probe shatters. You, your probe is completely unusable then. So if you're skiing somewhere, and remember, even if you're skiing somewhere with powder or soft snow, that doesn't mean you can't have hard chunks. When avalanches set up, they, they say that they set up like concrete. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your probe. There is a time and place for carbon probes. I have um, two aluminum probes here. I have a 265 centimeter probe and a 320 centimeter probe. They're all done in centimeters, so just switch your mind a little bit. So I've got 320, 265, and 240. It is up to you what you want to choose. Maybe it's early season and there's only so much snow and the risk of big avalanches is low. Use a smaller, a smaller probe. If you're asking why you would use a smaller probe when bigger probes are available, that's a great question. The only answer is weight. Okay, so, um, so yeah, you want to choose which probe to use. I recommend something that most avalanche experts will also recommend, which is to take your probe out of the little sleeves, the storage sleeves that they come in. They come in these little things, which you might think, oh, that's a great way to keep my backpack organized by having this sleeve. Well, the reason that you're not supposed to use these, according to most experts, um, is because when you, okay, your friend is buried in an avalanche. It's the most hectic, terrible situation of your entire life. You have no idea where they are. You've found the closest beacon signal you can get, and now you're digging through your backpack to find this thing, and then you're like, oh my gosh, how do I open it? And then you have to do this, and the Velcro gets stuck. It seems like easy, right? That's five seconds, three seconds, two seconds. I bet your friend who's buried in the avalanche would be really grateful to get out two seconds earlier. There is no benefit to using these little uh, pouches. Don't, don't use them. Get rid of them. Um, 
I store them in it at home just because otherwise we're kind of doing this, but really there's no reason to have those things. So I always leave the handle or the grab handle of the probe facing up. And I also always use backpacks for the most part that have an avalanche safety equipment pocket that's separated from the main part. So that means when your friend is buried in an avalanche and you want to get to your beak or your shovel and probe as fast as possible, you know exactly where they are. They're not buried somewhere in the rest of everything else. Instead, you open in this backpack, one buckle, boom, it com it's a completely separate area of volume and you can access those. In this backpack, there are two sleeves similar to those probe sleeves that are open on either end. So I'm gonna uh, store my probe in one of those sleeves. Guys, all it takes to get to that thing is one buckle and my hand's on my probe already. I put handle up, put it in that sleeve, it's super organized. Next thing I'm gonna carry is a avalanche shovel. I brought two down right now from the gear room um, to show you a couple different examples. This one is aluminum, and they're both aluminum. This one weighs quite a bit more. You can tell there are two different size and shape blades, also two different size, pretty similar shaped handles. But the main thing is, check this out. That one has a telescopic handle. Okay, there's a couple things to consider when you're thinking about avalanche shovels. I'm not gonna get into it too much, but first off, let me say there are two schools of thought. The traditional school of thought, which you'll probably still hear more frequently, is get the biggest shovel, get the biggest shovel you can get. Why do you get the biggest shovel you can get? Because hey, if you were buried, wouldn't, wouldn't you want your friend moving as much snow as possible, as quickly as possible? Would you rather give them a giant snow shovel or like a teacup, right? That is the traditional mindset. Well, I've recently come under the impression that there's another mindset, and that is the fact that carrying more snow with each and every shovel stroke is more tiring. And the hardest part about ev any avalanche rescue, ask most rescuers, is the shoveling. It can be exhausting. If your friend is buried six feet deep, that is tons, literal tons, as in 2,000 pounds, of snow that you are moving. Do you want the biggest shovel and for each one to be more work to move, but you can move that amount of snow in fewer shovel strokes? Or do you want a smaller shovel blade? Each one is lighter, you can do more of them, but you have to do more of them. Um, I don't know of any data that has convinced me that a bigger shovel using fewer strokes is better or easier than the opposite. So, which one do you use? Well, the smaller one is lighter, so I'm just gonna probably use that one. If you have a different opinion of it, I would love to hear it, but generally, it's all about moving as much snow as fast as possible. You can choose which of those two directions you wanna go. They make plastic shovels, please stay away from them. Plastic shovels break. Same with carbon shovels. If you're, if you're kind of scared of using a carbon fiber probe because you're afraid it's gonna shatter, imagine what a carbon fiber shovel is doing when you're jamming it into those concrete blocks of snow to try to get to your friend as fast as possible while you're sweating, while you're freaking out, while there's hang fire, whatever it is. You wanna use an aluminum sh uh, shovel. You can see the end of them get super beat up. I've never had to dig anyone out of an avalanche, but I've had to use my shovel, that, whether that's digging um, snow pits or practice doing practice shoveling because I do a lot of that every season. We do um, strategic shoveling to simulate rescues of buried avalanche ski or av skiers and avalanches. Um, the last thing is the handle. Um, they come, or excuse me, um, this has a telescopic one. I am under the impression that just provides more leverage, which is really good. Um, if I'm gonna have the option of a telescopic handle or a similar sized handle that's not telescopic, I'm gonna go for telescopic. If it's, too, if it's too much work for you to do this with your gloves on or something, you're in too much of a rush, you can always do it without that. Um, however, if you have the wherewithal while you're trying to dig your friend out to make your shovel handle longer, you're gonna have more leverage. Lastly is the handle. They make D handles and T handles. In addition, they make all these shovels that go into hoe mode and stuff. I want the most simple avalanche rescue kit that I can possibly get, so that's why I've chosen to use this shovel. The handle, the blade is almost the exact same size. The handle is almost the same length without being extended with no telescoping necessary, and the top handle is still a regular D handle. This is significantly lighter. I don't have to deal with the telescopic features. It has these cool little grips. This one's made by Peeps, P-I-E-P-S. Maybe you have some of their uh, avalanche equipment like beacons, um, and there's only one thing to put together. It's super easy, I highly recommend this shovel. So far, I've really liked it. So, I will take the handle. Yes, question? 
Um, do you, what are your thoughts on shovels with the backhoe option? Yeah, my, the shovels with the backhoe option, I personally think it's gimmicky. I come. In my experience, the bottom of my backpack is going to have my first aid kit because fortunately it's not something I need to use very quickly, however, or very frequently, however, I know where it is. I know exactly how to get to it with one hand in my backpack as fast as possible. First aid kit, we're not going to go through the contents and that's not because it's a thing of time or preference or anything like that. It's because if you don't know how to use what's in my first aid kit, my first aid kit is, is, of, is of no use to you. If I don't know how to use what's in yours, yours is of no use to me. First aid kits are a very personal thing based on your level of experience, your level of training, and your familiarity with how to use different medical devices, right? Some people will carry as little as a roll of tape. Other people are gonna carry those big like wilderness first aid, uh, first aid kits because they think that that is what they need in order to solve problems that they may experience in the backcountry. My first aid kit has been honed every single year, a couple times a year, um, based on my experience. As my experience in my training in wilderness first aid increase, I change what's in here. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, yeah. Um, folks are asking, have you ever done a wilderness first aid kit course? And so maybe tell them like your training. Yeah, sure. So I'm sitting here talking about the different styles of training you can get. Um, I've done many wilderness first aid courses. Um, most recently, I just recertified my wilderness first responder, which you may be familiar with as a woofer. Um, I just recertified that for the second or third time now. Um, I've taken wilderness first aid. I've taken custom courses specific to backcountry skiing first aid. Um, there's a variety of options out there. I personally feel so much better as a ski partner knowing I have that training, even if I can't use it on myself. And I look at my ski partners who dedicate their time, their money, their energy um, into taking these courses. I look upon them really highly. My ski partners that I have that like, oh yeah, I took a woofer like 15 years ago or kind of the same with avalanche education, right? I took my level two in like 99. Those ski partners um, definitely get a different look for me. I consider that when I'm choosing objectives to ski with them. I consider that when choosing where I'm, or yeah, where I'm gonna ski with them and how frequently I'm gonna ski with them. And also when I take into account their input during the day of decision making. Um, I want the safest, most experienced, most well-trained partner I can get. Um, first aid kit is gonna be in the bottom if, if it's durable. If it's stuff that can break and you're constantly putting your backpack on the ground or in your car, you don't wanna have it on the bottom. Um, your first aid kit needs to be in something waterproof. I usually use a roll top, uh, like one to two, one or to three liter dry bag or something like that. this that is also completely waterproof. Um, I have it in here all the time. When I've used first aid kits that are not completely waterproof in the past, every day from the bottom of your backpack where all the moisture and wetness accumulates, when that stuff accumulates in the bottom of your backpack and soaks your first aid kit, you gotta dry it every single day. It also makes some of your stuff like your tape and your gauze and your bandages go bad. You want your first aid kit to stay dry. I highly recommend like a really small, like Sea to Summit makes these little one liter, half liter even dry bags. They're awesome. Is there something else? Okay, cool. Um, in my first aid kit is everything to take care of a patient that has experienced an injury in the backcountry that I know how to address. There is nothing in here that I don't know what it is or don't know how to use it because that is of no use to me. For that reason, I go through my woofer training notebooks and manuals frequently and I also go through my first aid kit frequently to re-up and uh, kind of remind myself uh, what exactly I have in here and why I have it in here. That's going to go in the bottom of my backpack. I always put it on the same side of my backpack. I know exactly where it is and how to reach it. Next up is an emergency puffy jacket. Um, this is not for me, unless I'm the one who's had the emergency. This is an extra layer that's only gonna be used in the event of an emergency. It's the lightest puffy jacket I could possibly find. This one's like a Patagonia something puff. Um, it's not incredibly warm, but I think when you're injured, this will feel incredibly, incredibly good. I've had to use these on injured patients in the backcountry before. If I have it rolled up into its own hood right now, if you didn't take the how to dress for backcountry skiing workshop last week. You didn't learn the fact that there are ways to tell if your backpack can, or if your clothing can be stuffed in its own pockets or if you need to have a stuff sack. 
A down jacket in the bottom of your backpack, not in a stuff sack, is gonna be just like a first aid kit. It's gonna get saturated, it's gonna get wet, and it's not gonna be of any use when it comes down to it, because again, down is not good when it's wet. Look at all of the pockets um, in your layers, and you see the zipper pulls? Look for the zipper pull, if your jacket can stuff in its own pocket, that has another zipper on the inside. That is the pocket that you can stuff uh, to hold your jacket in. So, this is, the zip, this is the pocket, it's just one of the hand pockets, but this one on the left side has a zipper pull on the inside. I'm gonna flip the jacket inside out and just stuff it into that pocket, because that pocket, the pocket lining itself, also acts as a stuff socket for that jacket. Odds are, some of your uh, jackets that you have, or even some of your snow pants, have this feature and you don't even know, because it's not something frequently advertised, but it's really, really nice, because this pocket lining is um, waterproof enough polyester that I don't, I don't need to dry this on a regular basis. Is that between left? Cool. Um, so this is my emergency layer. I'm gonna zip it up using that same zipper that had the zipper pull on both sides, and I'm gonna store this in the bottom of my backpack right next to my first aid kit. I'm gonna store it in this orientation while the first aid kit is in this orientation because it takes up the bottom and it makes the bottom completely flat like there's nothing in it. So far this bag still weighs pretty much nothing. There is not a whole lot going on in here, and that's how I want to keep it. Hi spaghetti. Hi girl. Cool. So, um, so I'm just going ski touring for a day right now. I'm just going to pack up what I would generally have. Next thing I'm going to put in here is my ski jacket. This is the jacket that I'm going to wear on the way down. It's my waterproof shell. It's like a rain shell pretty much. It's super small. It's super light and I'm only going to wear it on the way down or in case I really need to protect myself from the elements and getting hot is not too much of an issue. I'm going to put this in here next. Because that means everything, so I'm going to use this as soon as I get to the top. Everything from here on up, I'm going to use either at the top or before I get to the top of my ski run. Keep that in mind. Yeah, question? Down or synthetic for the emergency jacket? Yeah, I use down for the emergency jacket because down is lighter and, and more packable. Synthetic is obviously better waterproofness. Um, I just... I don't ski in a very wet climate, so I'm going to use down. And I also have an emergency blanket in my first aid kit that I can lay down on the ground to put a patient on top of before I put the jacket on them. Go ahead. Um, in terms of avalanche tools, do you pack a rush block cord or a snow saw? If so, what's your preference? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, snow saw and rush block cords, um, I have them both out here and I'll show you how those fit into my kit. Uh, thank you for asking that though. Um, so everything from here on up gets used every single run. That's to keep, to keep that in mind right now. There's almost nothing in here. There's a first aid kit and a jacket and shovel and probe, and that's it. Everything else is gonna be used every run. Ski jacket, next. Um, next up will be my warm gloves that I'm hopefully not gonna wear until I get to the top. I'm gonna put those in next on top of the ski jacket. Again, this orientation, so I'm kind of stacking like this. But the gloves aren't the full width of the backpack. That's the first item that's not the full, is this in the shower neck? That's not the full width. So I'm gonna take my water. I personally carry a half liter of water for most half day to all day ski tours. Maybe you carry a liter. Maybe you're one of the people that have the liter and a half in allergens. Maybe you carry two liters of water. That is completely on you and that's your decision to make. Why don't you start by carrying a lot of water and at the end of the day, see how much you drink. If you only drank this much, maybe you can start rethinking the fact that you still carry this every single time you go skiing. I personally don't drink water while I'm out generally. Maybe I'll take a couple of sips if I'm waiting for someone or something like that. Um, I have this in case of an emergency, whether I or someone else get hurt, you need to give that person food and water. And so I always have a little bit of water with me. So from here on out, I'm just gonna assume this is your size water bottle. I orient it vertically on the side of my backpack, still in that main pocket, but I always put it on the same side so I can just reach in and find it right away. Again, a lot of people don't like these top load backpacks because it's so overwhelming to like, where is everything? There's only a few things in here and they're packed the same way every time. You will not have a hard time finding them. So, water, it always goes on this side actually, but water vertically. It's right there. And if I don't, I don't remember which side it's on, well, I'm out there, all I have to do is this and I can feel my water bottle because it's against the side. Highly recommend it. Um, next up, um, well, to be honest, next up, I, I'm not gonna take any of this stuff in my main pocket. Um, I do, this backpack has two very small pockets, on the in, uh, one on the outside here and one on the inside. Let me talk about what I put in those. 
The inside pocket is for small stuff that I don't expect to use. Um, that pocket is, it's like right on the top of the back panel. Um, it's easily accessible, but it's like really flat. It doesn't have much space. So I'm gonna put stuff that, in there that I don't expect to use, but I can access if need be. One of those things is hand warmers. I also have a different set of hand warmers in my first aid kit. These are to use if my hands actually get cold. The ones in my first aid kit are to use to keep someone alive. Keep that in mind. I have two sets of hand warmers. Even though I'm a super lightweight minimalist guy, I'm still gonna have two sets of hand warmers. That's gonna go in that top little pop pouch. Um, skin wax is something that I've started carrying year round, not just in the spring. If you don't know what skin wax is, uh, it's to prevent globbing in the bottom of your ski. This is called glob stopper, this specific skin wax. I'm gonna put that in that pocket as well. And now to answer your question, um, I'm also gonna put an ECT cord in there that can be used as a rouge block cord. Um, I don't personally carry a snow saw, generally. I don't dig a ton of snow pits. If you're someone that digs a lot of snow pits, I highly recommend a snow saw um, because they make it a lot better. In early season, when I am digging a lot of snow pits to get familiar with the snow pack for the rest of the year, I'm not going to be, uh, excuse me, I am going to be carrying this. Later in the season, I put this away for the year, unless I plan on digging a snow pit, and I put my ECT cord in here, and usually someone else has a snow saw, or you can just like make it like a kind of a rough, hasty snow pit, but this is always pretty nice to have, and it can also be used in emergencies, yeah. What about a snow study kit besides a field journal that I keep in my pant thigh pocket? Do you carry a lupe slash magnifying glass Lube. plus avalanche crystal card? I don't pack a slope meter or thermometer, is that dumb? No, that's a great question. So um, this again is personal risk tolerance and personal like desire for information about the snow when you're out there. If you ski really, really frequently, you may be really familiar with the snow pack and you may not need, need the, feel the need to like look at snow crystals on a crystal card with a loop every day. The beginning of the season, I carry all of that stuff with me. Taking courses, of course, I take all of that stuff with me. Um, when I go out ski touring on an average day, I'm probably not digging a snow pit. The reason I'm not digging a snow pit is, excuse me, is because I'm so confident in the snow where I'm skiing. If I'm skiing an area that I'm questioning, I'm probably not gonna ski it or I'm going to bring those tools with me. Um, but I'm not a person who stops, dig a proper snow pit every single time, pull my loop out, pull my crystal card out, take notes on it. If you're someone that carries your, your snow science journal in your side pocket all the time, that is awesome. That is not me personally. If you don't know what I'm talking about right now, take an avalanche safety course. But I appreciate that question very much. And I definitely appreciate my friends that carry that stuff. Um, however, I'm just typically not skiing the terrain where I feel the need to do those things. Unless I leave my home mountain range and then it goes with me, yeah. Do you carry an emergency sled to carry someone injured? I personally do not carry an emergency sled to carry an injured person, but I do know how to construct one out of the equipment that I have. That's all available online. There's a variety of different techniques. They all suck, you guys. I ski in the Wasatch mostly for most of the, the winter at least. Um, and in the Wasatch, people don't carry snow slides because you're so quick to get rescued typically. Um, I've had to get someone out of the backcountry before and ski patrol from a nearby ski area, which wasn't even that close, but it's, it's, it is close in the grand scheme of things. It's just not close for the Wasatch. They were able to get to that person like by the time I was able to construct a sled out of the materials I have. Um, I personally don't carry a sled. I don't carry a tarp as cover. However, I have that emergency blanket that can be used as a covered tarp if I need to dig a snow cave or something like that. Um, and again, all of the training I've put in has kind of honed this kit that I have and it's helped me determine what I'm willing to carry and what I'm, what I'm willing to kind of cut out of the kit. If I could carry all the weight in the world, would I carry a full snow science kit and a full rescue sled every time? For sure. Am I doing that in practice? No. Is that up to you? For sure. ECT cord in that same little pocket. A lot of the winter, I'm not even gonna carry that with me, but again, it's good to have just as like a field repair kit, if nothing else. Uh, I'm gonna leave these gloves that I'm gonna be ski touring up in. Those are gonna go in my backpack last, just because I wanna put it in my car and then pull these out. I wanna show you skins. I have the skin savers on them right now. Um, I don't use these skin savers except in the summer when my ski season is over. And as of right now, my ski season is ostensibly over. So I've put my, this is how you know I'm not skiing right now when I'm using skin savers because these are not something I use. Um, and if you, if you use them, that's fine. P.S. There's no reason to use them on a daily basis. If you're like going skiing, guys, you don't need to carry these out. You can stick glue to glue on your skins and they'll still last a really long time. Um, anyways, 
My skins are on my skis before I leave the house. That way I don't forget them and that way I'm not slowing anyone down to trailhead. I don't wanna be messing while I'm cold because if you took how to dress for backcountry skiing last week, you'll know that I, I start really cold and I don't have layers to be wearing at the car, right? I'm like down to nothing at the car. So I just wanna start skinning right away. The more experienced skiers you go out with, the more people that you're gonna notice have their skins on when they arrive at the trailhead. So these are already on my skis when I get to the trailhead. Headlamp, I always carry a headlamp. If you've seen my Instagram stories lately, you've realized that accidents don't happen to people that are expecting to have an accident. They're called accidents because they have people that happen to people that aren't expecting it. I frequently go out in the morning and expect to be done by noon. Does that mean I can't be caught overnight? No. So what do I do? Carry the smallest, cheapest headlamp I can get as like an extra measure of safety so I can stack the cards in my favor if I have an accident and I need to spend the night out. What do I do though? Because I don't want to mess with this every day and leaving batteries in here is going to make the battery acid bleed. I take the batteries out and store them in that same pocket. They're just stored by themselves. The headlamp is in there with no batteries in it. But that always goes in that same internal pocket that I'm hoping to not have to access. Batteries are separate. That goes in that little zippered pocket. Um, I take the amount of nutrition that I need for that day. I typically have, I don't have like a a recipe or a formula for what I take. I just go in this bin that I have in my cover here with Katie and I just like choose three snacks. Like today I have a honey stinger waffle that expired in 2017. That's mine. Okay. I have a cliff bar that expired a month ago, two months ago, and I have some cliff shot blocks that are so expired that the expiration date has worn off, but they expired in 2014. That's all I can read. So I just take three snacks. I know that I will probably eat none of these if I'm only out till noon or two. I'd like to eat one of these if I'm out the full day, but I have three of them in case I need to spend the night out. Those, I wanna be able to access, cause you know what, maybe I actually wanna eat something. I'm gonna put those on the outside in this pocket. I'm gonna leave them there. I'm gonna wear my watch because a watch is a safety device. A GPS watch like this Garmin Phoenix 6 is a safety device in the backcountry. I highly recommend you have one. You can give your lat long to rescuers. You can figure out where you are because they have topo maps on your watch and you can get way better situated. I also always carry, because I don't know when an accident's gonna happen to me, I carry the Garmin inReach. This is a two-way satellite communication device. They make the big one with all the information on the screen or they make the small one that you generally uh, Bluetooth to your phone and use your phone as the screen. This thing has plenty of battery life for one, two, seven days in the backcountry. This weighs nothing, it's like one ounce. You always wanna carry this. I leave it accessible so it can also get signal on the outside of my backpack and I leave it off. That is just ridiculous to not carry with you. Um, they're not very expensive. Subscriptions are pretty cheap and it is like the best, back like Katie knows because I'm able to talk to her in the backcountry. It's like the best backup plan you can possibly have in the backcountry is a two-way satellite communication device, not one of the one-way satellite communication devices like the spots or the other devices that people are tempted to use. I highly recommend two-way satellite communication. Um, I have, right now I have a new iPhone. As you know, the phone life diminishes greatly over the course of a year or two. When it's new like this, I don't carry a backup battery if I'm only planning on going out for one day. If I plan out for going out for more, if I plan on going out for more than one day, I carry a backup battery like this Goal Zero Flip 12. It's like really small, really light, you can charge your phone. Or, and excuse me, and I carry the smallest cord that I have tested in cold temperatures. Goal Zero makes it a little six inch iPhone cord and you just plug this thing in and you can get a whole charge on your phone. It's really important to have, especially when your phone starts to get older and the battery seriously suffers from cold or from bad conditions or anything like that, or just from being out for like six hours because that's what happens with the phone. I carry a neck warmer that I can also put up over my ears and over my head and over my face to stay warm. I just kind of toss that in there. I don't use that all the time. I ski in sunglasses that are such full coverage that I don't have any need for goggles. I put those on while I'm still in my gear room so I don't forget them because sunglasses are absolutely a safety device and I can ski in blizzards in these. These are Oakley's, every sunglasses company's making these really high coverage sunglasses. Um, they're all the same to me, whatever. Do I carry sunscreen and chapstick? No, I put sunscreen on before I leave the house. I don't have super sensitive skin. If you do, take the smallest little thing of sunscreen you can get. I got this a long time ago, it was like a keychain. I just keep refilling it with sunscreen. 
Um, and chapstick is not something I used to carry it in my pants pocket, but it hurt with every step that I take. So I just stopped carrying chapstick regularly. I put it on before I leave the house or when I get back to the car or whatever. Sunscreen definitely use every day. Lastly, I put, so I'd snack. Um, I put my helmet in my backpack because that's going to be the first thing that I access when I get to the top of the run or maybe even when I'm still climbing. I just put it in here. I get such a big backpack because I want to be able to just toss my helmet in here without Tetrising stuff. And that's how much time I have. That's how you're going to choose what size backpack you want. You can get a really small backpack that only fits what you have if you're willing to kind of what I do, what I say, Tetris your stuff every time you put it in. You know you can't put your gloves in before your jacket because it won't all fit. Instead, I get a backpack that is cavernous compared to the amount of stuff that I have, so I can easily put my helmet in without even thinking about it. It's, my backpack is maybe 25% full, maybe 40% full, something like that. My helmet can go in in any orientation. It can just sit on top. I can reach around it because my backpack is big enough to access my water. I can get my other gloves without pulling my helmet out, but it's always on top. I also like to store my gloves sometimes inside my helmet so they're even more accessible. Or if I'm skiing with goggles, I put my goggles inside my helmet. Question? Um, is your bag 45 or 35 liters? This backpack is 30 liters. I used to use a 45 liter backpack on a daily basis and it was just so empty. I can still avoid Tetrising stuff. I don't have to have this stuff perfectly packed. I don't have to compress my down jacket. And this is still a 30 liter backpack. That's it. If I shed a layer, that mid layer that I wear when I'm skinning, if I shed that while I'm skinning, I still have a ton of space in here. If I'm skinning with a thicker mid layer because it's super cold, I still have a ton of space in here. So I highly recommend something that gives you some extra space but doesn't have way overkill because a lot of people carry a lot of stuff that they don't need. A couple of ski straps I have in my first aid kit, but I have these out just to remind people these can work wonders. They can fix bindings, they can fix boots, they can fix skis, they can fix poles, they can fix your backpack, they can fix broken bones, they can't fix broken bones, they can stabilize broken bones. Um, they can help you make splints. Ski straps, also called volet straps, because that's who invented them. Um, super, super important. If you're curious what's in my uh, repair kit that I carry on expeditions or on daily ski trips, Outside Magazine just did a story on me this week on the website about what you carry in a field repair kit for backcountry skiing. It addresses my kit specifically. Uh, go check it out on outsideonline.com. Um, but I don't carry much in the way of a field repair kit for everyday skiing aside from these because the Wasatch is small enough where I can limp out pretty much no matter what. A broken boot, a broken binding, just, it's never happened to me before pretty much, and it's probably not gonna happen to me on any given day. I'm willing to deal with the consequences and carry, instead of carrying like a heavy field repair kit every time I go skiing. Lastly, one more reason to have a backpack that's big enough is because, you know what? If I need to add an ice axe to my kit, all my backpacks can carry ice axes. If I need to add ski crampons, there's plenty of space in here to add ski crampons. If I need to add regular crampons, there's plenty of space to add regular crampons and still shove my layers in here. I just like to think through all the possible scenarios. If you have any questions, ask them now because we're running out of time. I like to think through of the, all the possible scenarios, how much stuff would I realistically actually have in my backpack at the same time and does it fit in there? This backpack definitely checks those boxes. A couple little tips and tricks I may have written down. Um, I like to carry enough food and water for myself and my partners just in case things go south or they just forgot their food and water. It's really nice to be the guy that pulls out a thermos of tea or some chocolate or an extra cliff bar because your buddy ran out of food. Yeah, so uh, radios are one thing that a lot of people like to carry in the backcountry. There's been some pretty well documented avalanche accidents that would have suffered very different fates had they had two-way radios. Um, I bought two two-way radios two years ago and every day I went skiing, I gave one to my partner and kept one to myself. Um, Goal Zero Charger, phone, Garmin, phone is your most important piece of safety equipment. Always carry your phone in the backcountry. Um, Garmin watch, Garmin inReach are also two really important pieces of safety equipment. Um, ski straps, hand warmers, chapstick, sunscreen, and skin wax all go in that little inside pocket if I'm carrying them. Um, and lastly, just simplify your kit. Simple is so much quicker, it's easier, it's more fun, and it allows you to know, I know exactly what's in this backpack and where it is because it's in the same spot every single time I go skiing. Um, keep it simple. I pull everything out. I completely empty this backpack every single time I get done skiing and get home because I want everything to be perfectly dry. I don't want any mold. I don't want any smells. 
You don't want just to find wrappers in the bottom of your backpack, guys. Like, you want to have your backpack clean. You know when you're skiing with someone and they, like, they find, like, oh, there's, like, half an eaten cliff bar in there. I can't believe it, you know? You want to be avoiding that stuff because you just want to be simple and, like, a tight package, you know? Like, you tighten these straps and you just keep it small and keep it tight. And you know where everything is. You know what you have. Question. No, it was one minute. Oh, one minute, cool. Um, I like to do a test where I close my eyes and name what's in my backpack and where it is. I can easily do that with this kit because I carry it every single day and it really increases my familiarity with it. Lastly, don't have anything dangling on the outside of your backpack. You don't want that. A helmet will be hitting your side with every step. A water bottle is just gonna fall out and roll down the mountain. Have everything inside your backpack in a tight package. Check out Brody11.com, Venmo donations to at Brody11, and uh, get in my email list for future workshops. Thanks, guys.